button this time. And this is uh, envisioning a design system maintained by the Drupal community. I'm Brian Perry. As I uh, mentioned before, uh, there's a link, a bit.ly link, uh, to these slides if you want to check them out or save them for later. Uh, I, uh, yeah, Brian Perry, I am a staff software engineer at Pantheon. I uh, am a former initiative coordinator for Drupal's Decoupled Menus initiative. Uh, that initiative is complete. I live in the Chicago suburbs, uh, so, you know, had a really nice, slow, almost 90 minute drive in this morning. It was great. Uh, I enjoy uh, Drupal, JavaScript, and uh, all things Nintendo. Very jealous of seeing uh, a recent trip to the, uh, the Super Nintendo world. Uh, in the world of video games, I recently finished, uh, in, in, judging by the sweatshirt here, uh, Metroid Prime Remastered for Switch, which is amazing, and it's my favorite game of all time, and the remaster was awesome. Uh, waiting for uh, the new Zelda game in a couple weeks. That'll be the only thing I play for a while. And the other completely random video game related suggestion I have is there is a uh, documentary from this uh, studio called Double Fine who made like Psychonauts and Broken Age. It is a 20 hour documentary on the production of one of their games. And it's also really interesting from the perspective of just uh, developing software. So cool stuff. Uh, I also own the domain webcomponents.wtf. Uh, currently not doing anything with it, but seemed relevant for some of the stuff we'll be talking about today. <laughs> I am uh, on the internet in a variety of places and uh, would gladly internet with you. As I mentioned, uh, I work for uh, Pantheon. main thing that I, I want to mention is um, that uh, a lot, uh, not all, but many of the things that we'll be talking about, uh, Pantheon has sponsored some of the open source work for. Um, so I thank them for that. Also, I'm focused on uh, their front end sites uh, project, which can be used for uh, decoupled hosting for Drupal or WordPress. So would love to talk more about that. And then for no particular reason after that slide, as an individual, I would just like to mention that I don't support hatred. Uh, it's weird that I have to say that. Perhaps you could uh, say that I don't have the right to say that. Uh, but um, as an individual, that's my stance. And if you want to talk more about this or are confused by this, <laughs> I would be happy to talk more. So uh, back to the task at hand. Uh, the title of this talk is Envisioning a Design System Maintained by the Drupal Community. So. We'll be asking uh, a number of uh, what, if, what if questions and envisioning a handful of different things here. So the first thing, these are you know, somewhat leading questions, but what if there were a set of Drupal friendly components that anybody could use, and you could use them in Twig, and you could use the same components with any JavaScript framework, and it was easy to extend them, contribute new ones, change them. Uh, that obviously would be wonderful from my perspective. And what if web components made this possible? So here when we're talking about web components, we're not necessarily talking about the JavaScript frameworks like React or Vue. Uh, when you explain web components kind of at this level, you probably already lost. But here we're talking about web components as a set of uh, web platform APIs. Three main pieces custom elements, the shadow DOM, and uh, HTML templates. And we'll touch on all of those things along the way here. And since this is, these are core web platform APIs, they're not tied to a particular framework. So let's just jump in and look at an example of a web component. So this is a, a card component from a project uh, called Generic Drupal Web Components that we'll be uh, seeing some examples of today. Um, but on the right-hand side, you can see it's just a, a card. It has an image, headline, body text, a link. Uh, very common component. In this JavaScript file here, we're importing uh, a JavaScript file and then uh, also a style sheet. And then if we just look at the markup, so this is a, uh, a code sandbox. Um, just an HTML document in this case. Um, so in the markup, you'll see now we have this gdwc-card uh, element that we can just use in our markup. 
And we're also passing in a few different properties, like the image source, headline, body text, and etc. And if we change those things, the component re-renders. The other interesting thing worth noting here is that below the card, there's just a traditional paragraph. And you'll notice that the, the card component has its own styling. Uh, but the paragraph below it uh, has just the styling of the document, which in this case is nothing. Um, so it's just default browser styling. But those things don't, uh, in this case, uh, cross paths. So uh, with that simple HTML example, let's look at a few, uh, the same component in a few different contexts. So this is a screenshot of the same card used as a teaser view for content in a uh, Olivero sub-theme. It looks exactly the same, except in this case, uh, content from Drupal is coming through. And here's a quick look at uh, what has to happen behind the scenes for that. Um, so you need to create a library to import the style sheet and JavaScript file for the component. And then in the node article teaser.html twig template, um, you basically just can use that uh, custom element like any other markup that you would in your twig template. And you can still do all of the things that you're used to doing in twig. So we're using attributes, so you can use um, twig filters and things like that, and reference content from Drupal. Um, an exciting uh, kind of future Drupal development. Uh, anybody, I don't know if anybody's familiar with the work that's been done recently around single directory components, um, but that is something that I believe landed in Drupal 10.1. And without going too deep into it, that uh, feature will actually make this even easier if you just put your CSS, JavaScript, and your template in one directory. Drupal will just pick that up and make a component <coughs> out of it, which is really exciting. Um, so this is yet another context. This is the same component used in a JavaScript framework, in this case, view. So if we look at our uh, view file here, there is a template up top. We're using the same custom element, um, this time you know, statically passing in some values. Um, there's also a, a completely unrelated component there. And then we're you know, essentially doing the same thing, importing our JavaScript and importing our style sheet. And again, the card looks the same. So um, you know, seeing that one web component used in a few different contexts, um, I definitely think there are some pros to uh, using web components like this. So one, uh, as I've already touched on, is that they're core web APIs. The different frameworks uh, all have their slightly different APIs, slightly different takes on things. Some of their APIs change over time. Like, for example, uh, you know, a couple of years ago at this point, uh, React introduced hooks, which kind of changed how uh, everybody approached building components in React. Um, but this is just something that's part of uh, the browser and the web platform now. Uh, there is wide browser support for this. That wasn't always the case. Um, but now, in all evergreen browsers, especially now that uh, IE 11 is dead and we can all dance on its grave, um, uh, it's supported, yeah, in all evergreen browsers. And then there's also the concept of the Shadow DOM, which we'll dig into via a few examples. Um, but that really does allow you to create a component that is truly encapsulated like we saw. We saw that same card, and without really doing much of anything, it looked the same in all the different contexts we used it. Used it. Part of that is the Shadow DOM, which is its own kind of allowing components to have its own isolated DOM outside of the, the global DOM in the document. Um, yeah, and all that really does give you a component that you can write once and use everywhere, even across JavaScript frameworks, which is awesome. It's just a new HTML thing you can use. Um, however, not without uh, some potential cons. So partially because you know, this is a core browser technology, 
The uh, developer ergonomics, in, in my opinion, are a little rough without using a supporting library. So you can write uh, um, web components using just vanilla JavaScript without bundling anything. Um, but I find that it's uh, more pleasant using a library like Lit. I kind of, uh, Lit's a Google project, I kind of associate it one-to-one -one with building web components. But it adds some things like uh, templating that you know I've just become used to as a front-end developer. Um, helps you avoid some boilerplate, handle some common things about um, properties and attributes, updating. Um, just makes the whole deal more pleasant. Uh, styling can potentially be unintuitive, um, depending on how you use the different features of web components. And it's really just because they introduce features um, about scoping and encapsulation that were not the way we thought about styling in CSS traditionally. Um, all CSS uh, usually is part of just the global document, so can conflict in different places. You have to do certain things to scope using classes or specificity, um, and this definitely changes the game, which requires you to think about things a little bit differently. Um, you know, kind of touched on this in the first one, but because this is a core web technology and is not a framework, um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have some of the developer experience things that you'd have in React. Like, it doesn't have opinions about bundling your code or anything like that. Uh, increasingly, bundling is not necessary with uh, web components, and I hope that continues, but regardless. And then also, this is these components are JavaScript at the end of the day. So for them to be fully interactive and mounted on the page, JavaScript needs to load, um, which means that you know, there are potentially some server-side rendering issues. That is something that is also improving with the web component spec, but you know, something that to be mindful of, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit towards the end. So, uh, but I, I think that on an infinite time scale, uh, these types of browser native components are going to be an important part of building for the web. Like using components is not something that's going to go away anytime soon. Um, the thing that, as I learned about web components, I had my doubts about is like if this particular approach to it is the thing that is going to survive. I do think that it's going to continue to evolve, but I am more and more confident that like this is the thing that is going to represent components in uh, you know, general browser tech. However, on a, like a much shorter time scale, I think that all of us uh, will be running into web components either in our actual browsing of the internet or you know, if we're building on the front end, more and more. So your, your bundle, if you uh, pull down a library from uh, NPM, maybe you're looking for a component even to use in a React project, it may be that behind the scenes, it's actually a web component, so that it can be used with different frameworks. Um, but it does the thing that you want it to do, and you don't really have to care one way or the other. But I think that over time, more and more of the things that you work with, even if you're not explicitly seeking them out, will use this technology. Uh, there's a lot more to talk about related to web components. Um, uh, I, I gave a talk in the past at uh, Decoupled Days that was just a deeper dive on web components. There's a link to that if you want to check that out. There's been other great talks in the community. Uh, Andy at Lullabot uh, at New England Drupal Camp, I believe, gave another great talk on the topic. So if you're interested, check that out. So um, going back to uh, more of a uh, actual use case here, um, what if we made a menu web component for Drupal? So I mentioned previously that I was involved with the uh, decoupled menus initiative. And uh, part of that project was building a new endpoint uh, that also is going to be added in uh, Drupal 10.1 to expose menu data from Drupal in, in a way that is easier to use on the front end. Um, but another thing that we did is that at, at a past DrupalCon, we got a bunch of front-end developers together and did kind of like a hackathon thing and encouraged everybody to try to build a bunch of front-end components that consume data from this new endpoint. So what I wanted to, to work on, I was just starting to learn about web components. I, I wanted to see like, you know, what would it be like if I uh, built a web component to achieve this? So 
This is that component. Um, you'll see on the right-hand side, there's the menu. The styling is intentionally stripped down, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a sec. Um, but you know, we can expand and collapse the menu within the, the mobile view because the viewport is a little uh, smaller here. But you know, we can expand and collapse elements. And then if we look at the markup, um, similar thing where there is this GGWC menu uh, custom element and we can pass in data. So the branding is the, the title in the header. Uh, perhaps more interesting is that base URL there. So that is the root of a Drupal uh, instance um, with this menu endpoint enabled. So that's what allows uh, this component to go reach out to Drupal and get the menu data, parse it, and display it like this. Um, there's also the menu ID, that's the machine name of the menu, so if we change that to the account menu, you'll see that it goes, uh, gets data from Drupal again. Since we're not authenticated, the uh, account menu just has a login link. Um, but we'll change it back to main, so it has a little more stuff. And then also there is this uh, theme attribute as well. So that, had, uh, that allows some basic ways to affect the look and feel of this component. So right now it's the horizontal uh, theme, but we can remove it. And if we remove that theme, it just has very light styling to make the expand and collapse possible. Um, but alternatively, there also is a, uh, whoops, that was the wrong one, a theme of unstyled. And if we do that, it literally just is an unordered list uh, whose styling you can override. So uh, as kind of a, a you know, first step, dipping uh, toes into the water there, that seemed like a, a really interesting uh, use of web components, something that could be useful for Drupal projects. So within that uh, generic Drupal web components project, we, we immediately were like, okay, how can we build more of these things? Um, but found pretty quickly that some of the things that we did in that initial uh, you know, proof of concept component proved kind of hard to scale. So uh, the first thing, we touched on a little bit with the theming, but what if we wanted to restyle uh, these components? Um, the examples that we'll look at here are all in the storybook for this project, um, which is on um, the Drupal's GitLab pages at that link, if you ever want to play around with them. Um, but we'll also just open it up here. Okay, yes, yeah, so we're looking back at the uh, menu component again that we saw there. And here we were definitely exploring with uh, web components and some of the things that make their styling different. Like, how could we create a component that people could adapt to the look and feel of their site? So we already talked about the different uh, you know, theme attributes. Um, but there are a handful of other ways that you can affect the styling from the outside. So um, first off, in this component, we're using the shadow DOM, which means that the, the styles of this component are scoped to just that component. So there are some exceptions to this, but the basic idea is that styles uh, don't come in and they don't go out uh, beyond this component. So, uh, there are some ways that you can reach in and allow that outside styling to happen. Uh, this first one is the idea of a shadow part, which is a new CSS selector. So you can uh, explicitly define a part in the markup for your component and then uh, do something like this uh, part menu level selector here. Um, so there's a menu level and a menu item. And that is what allows us to override either a full section of the menu or an individual menu item to make it ugly pink and dotted <laughs> like we have there. But basically you can, using that selector, if you expose that, um, style it however you want from outside of the component. 
There also is the concept of slots in web components. So that is basically a place where you can put markup. Uh, all web components have a default slot, um, but also you can create named slots as well that might have a you know, specific purpose or a specific landing point in your markup. Um, so there is a slot for the branding here, which essentially allows you to override the entire markup of the header, pass in whatever markup you want. That markup is markup from the traditional DOM or light DOM, so it means that you can also override the styling of that from outside of the component. Um, so that's another way into it. And without getting too deep into this, um, web components are JavaScript classes. So assuming that the code allows this, you know, it's not like a private class or something, um, you can also extend the class and override it however you want. You could change the render method to completely change the markup, override the styling completely. Um, so, you know, that's a pretty big hammer, um, but you also have a lot of control there as well. And a couple uh, last things. So another option is using CSS variables or CSS custom properties. So I mentioned that in general, the rule is things don't uh, come in and things don't come out. Um, the big exception to that are uh, uh, inherited properties in your CSS. So those do uh, go through the shadow DOM. They do cascade down from the rest of your document. Um, so, for example, things like colors or font styles will do that. Um, but another thing that is inherited are uh, CSS variables. So you can also set, um, define particular CSS variables in your component that are honored. So like we have one to set the font family here. Um, and that allows you to set that value either at the uh, component itself or higher up in the document and have that cascade down. So you could share variables across these components and the rest of your document to do things like use the same set of colors or spacing or something like that. And then uh, the other last thing, um, which we didn't do a ton of this, but you can also just use classes in your markup as well. So you can you know, define a class and then use the existence of that class in your styles to affect how things look. So uh, obviously that is a lot. <laughs> um, it's many, many options uh, if you're using this new kind of scoped styling. And for a lot of them, it, it does seem to put a lot of responsibility on the person who's consuming and using the component. Um, and all of them require introducing some particular styling hook or API. So you know we talked about a lot of them, custom properties, classes, shadow parts and slots. Um, but the thing that we uh, gravitated towards, and I'm seeing a lot of similar web component libraries also do, is using CSS custom properties. Um, so they, they are inherited and do uh, cascade into the shadow DOM. Um, but the biggest thing from my perspective is that it really does provide a level playing field for the entire DOM. So like I said, you could set it uh, a variable for a particular component and just you know, make it blue or whatever. Um, but you could instead set those at the root of the document and it would be used by anything on that document, including your web components that <coughs> recognize it. Um, but still, you do have to kind of create a system for this and build those things in um, to allow that level of control. And then uh, one other thing that we uh, ran into while trying to develop a system like this for these components is this project Open Props. And uh, definitely some personal opinion uh, here, but I, I think of Open Props as kind of uh, tailwind just the good parts. Um, the reason for that is I definitely understand. Uh, so Tailwind is a uh, CSS library that uses um, atomic classes, so you use a lot of classes in your markup to define how things look and feel and not write things in a CSS file. I understand how that is uh, really useful to uh, developers and how that might be help with productivity. For me, because I learned how to style things through CSS, it's just not the way m my brain works, so it actually uh, slows me down at the moment. Um, so that's why 
I'm not a huge fan of, of that particular approach, but the thing that I do think is a, a really amazing part of Tailwind is its uh, set of design tokens, like its spacing scales and its color variables and providing a really well-defined system for those things is really amazing. So open props actually is just focused on that piece of the puzzle. Uh, a set of CSS variables um, that you can use uh, anywhere in your application, in your styling. And it has things like a, you know, sets of colors, gradients, spacing scales, animations, media queries, all, all kinds of wonderful stuff um, that you can just, just use to, rather than having to invent a system like this, um, you, know, you can follow. So yeah, I already talked about a lot of this, but um, it also does have essentially like a default set of styles, like a reset style sheet. Um, and it can be scoped to uh, either the main DOM or the shadow DOM for web components, which actually was a feature that they added uh, uh, by our request, which was awesome. Um, and then, you know, thinking of a component library like the, the project that we've been dipping in and out of here, um, by adopting this, it allows us to have a consistent way to make those theme controls available to a variety of different components. So if we look back at the card component here, we can see like what that actually means. So here's our card, uh, you know, similar to what we saw before. That's what it looks like. It looks like by default. But in Storybook, we have uh, essentially like all of the variables that this library now, now recognizes uh, as controls here. So we can actually pretty quickly uh, really change how this thing looks. So we can change the font family. We can change the heading text here. And then let's see. We can make the background, you know, can pretty quickly get into some kind of ugly things. <laughs> that could could be worse um, but we can you know add padding uh, to this that's maybe too much padding a little bit better uh, round out the corners of the card give it a uh, drop shadow etc etc um, so by allowing these components to kind of hook into that set of variables you can use them and again it could be this here is at the level of the component, but if you wanted to say that you know all of your headings are that color, you could set that at the root of the document, and it would cascade down to you know anything in the document that recognizes it and all of these web components. Um, so it really can kind of drastically change the look and feel here. And if we just clear it out, it goes back to what it was before. So. Um, you know, to be able to develop a library of components like this that, you know, you want to be able to have a consistent look and feel and match some other application, um, really helpful. Okay, and yeah, this is just one other example uh, in context that I think um, shows how this can be useful a little bit. This is our uh, view app, again, that we saw before. Um, Depending on how uh, you know, front-end detail-oriented you are, you may notice that the font stack is a little bit different between the card and the rest of the app. And depending on your personality, that might drive you insane. Um, but you know, using that variable, it actually makes it really easy, again, to set it at the root and have it cascade down so we can briefly break the whole application. <laughs> um, but set the font family and just copy the uh, font stack here. And then you'll see that that just cascades right into the component as well, and it matches a lot better. So um, back to some more what ifs. Um, so, you know, thinking again about components that can uh, also work well with with Drupal, either in a Twig template or you know outside of a Twig template in a decoupled application. Um, what if you know the components in this library could work with any data, but optionally knew a few things about Drupal? So 
To explore that, we're going to look at this link component. And uh, to get this out of the way up front, uh, creating a custom element for a link on its own is not very useful. You could just, you know, use the link element. <laughs> um, uh, so, but we do have that. We have uh, a link here that has, you know, all of the properties on a regular link, href, title, etc. Um, but where this gets a little bit more interesting is if you think about uh, a link here in a decoupled application that is sourcing data from Drupal. Um, for example, if you're using uh, JSON API, the data that you get back for a link field is not something that you can just use to immediately print out a link. Um, so you'll have to do a little bit to you know, get the right data from uh, that object. And then also in Drupal's links, there are still some Drupal specific things. Um, like there is, I can't remember if this, yeah, this does have an example of it. Um, so in this data object here, you'll see that there's like the internal prefix for internal links. And outside of the context of Drupal, that actually doesn't really mean anything. Um, so uh, what was added to this link component is the data property here. So you can just pass in uh, the object. In this case, it's the, the data for a link object, a link field in Drupal. And rather than having to you know, specify those properties individual, individually, it's going to look at that data object and use it to render a link. So you know, that's a case where having uh, a, a link element that knows a little bit about Drupal can save you some of that processing and you know, extra work there. So looking just a little bit more closely at how that actually works in this component. So in the render method uh, for the component here, we just check to see if that data attribute exists. And if it does, we run this process data function. And then when we render uh, the markup, it is just a, a link element, um, but we just use the values that are set uh, within the component. So um, this is the actual process data function, um, and it doesn't do a whole lot, but just does a little bit of processing. So if there is a uh, URI, it strips out the Drupal specific things so it can give you a link that would actually make sense outside of Drupal. And then for something like the title, if that is in the link object, it just sets that uh, property in the web component. Again, so you don't necessarily have to. Um, and so getting into the data there, that also kind of uh, gets a little bit into just, um, you know, more thinking about a uh, decoupled application of some kind, but managing data from Drupal across a series of components. So yeah, what if we wanted to manage our application state across multiple components? So we're looking back here at the menu component that we saw before. And you know, one of the interesting things that that does is you can pass in that base URL and it uses that to actually go talk to Drupal, get the data that it needs, and render out the menu hierarchy, which is nice. Uh, this is a, a little bit of the detail of what is actually happening behind the scenes. So um, when the uh, custom element mounts, it runs this fetch data method um, and takes in the base URL and also the menu ID, the machine name. And it uses that to construct the uh, endpoint that it should talk to. And then it just uses fetch to go uh, talk to uh, Drupal, get the data back. There's some light error handling. And then it parses the result into a hierarchy that can be more easily rendered in the component. So you know, again, not a ton of code. Uh, but nice that the component can handle that for you. But, uh, you know, if you start to think outside of just that one component, it doesn't really scale. So if we think about our card from before, um, for a card, you know, if you have one card, that could be one fetch call, 10 cards is 10, you have like 100 cards or an infinite scroll, you're potentially running into some problems. Um, 
So you know the solution for that is you know you want to take the data that you get back from Drupal and you know store it at some higher level that these components can uh, share. But you know how do the components in this library that their intent is to make it as easy to work with Drupal as possible? Like how could they consistently do that rather than embedding that sort of logic into the component like we did for the menu? So. Um, at the time that we were trying to solve that problem, there uh, really weren't uh, a lot of solutions for um, uh, like uh, libraries to talk to Drupal's APIs or anything with opinions on managing application state like this. Um, since then, there have been uh, some other similar solutions that have been developed in parallel with, uh, with uh, this library, but we built something called uh, Drupal State and uh, so the idea with Drupal State, it's a, you know, it's a node package that is uh, framework agnostic and universal, so you can use it on the server and on the client. Um, and it will talk to JSON API, and uh, it will uh, pull data from JSON API, but then for all future requests, it will just get it from a local data store. So it can cut down on the API request that you need to make back to Drupal. And it also uh, deserializes and kind of flattens out the structure of uh, the response. Um, if you have worked with uh, JSON API, there still is a little bit of Drupal that kind of comes through. Um, some, some things are under like an attributes object. You have to traverse things a little bit if you have reference entities. Um, so this simplifies that a little bit. A lot more about uh, this library, the decisions that were made, and kind of how it was built in a past DrupalCon talk, if you're interested. Um, but for the sake of this, uh, we'll just look at a quick example of what this actually looks like in practice. So here in our JavaScript file, we're importing Drupal state. And then that allows us to create an instance of, it's probably a little hard to see with the light, sorry about that, but um, an instance of uh, the Drupal state that is our store. And we again pass in the, the base of our uh, Drupal uh, endpoint. Um, it uses JSON API as a prefix by default, but you can also pass in a value for that. And then uh, with the store, you can do things like this. Uh, await store dot, uh, get object, so that just gets a, a particular object from JSON API. And then specify the object name. So in this case, it's uh, node recipe. So what that'll do is it'll uh, make a request out to JSON API and get all of the recipe data back and uh, also store that in our local data store. So if later on we needed to get one particular recipe based on its ID, um, we, you know, we can do the same get object call here, provide an ID, but what the library does is it checks local state first, it says, oh, I already have a recipe with that ID, uh, you know, a recipe object with that ID, and I'll just return that rather than talking to Drupal, um, saving you some API requests. And uh, again, you can see the response on the, the right-hand side, which is definitely a little bit more flat, um, you know, especially if you're familiar with, with what you get out of JSON API. So uh, you know, that brings us to you know, how could we use that <laughs> within a library like this? So um, you know, kind of pushing a, a little bit there, we, we asked, what if we created a web component itself? that could actually source data from Drupal. So this is kind of what that uh, little experiment looks like. We added uh, two additional components, uh, a store and a provider. So the store basically is a um, interface to the Drupal state store that we saw before. It has a lot of the same properties. You can pass in your API uh, base, prefix, a language, um, and then that is where the data is stored. It handles going out and talking to JSON API. And then within the store, you can have one or more providers. And those essentially are an interface to like that get object call that we saw. So it lets you go get specific pieces of data from JSON API. So 
We have um, object name, in this case, an ID for a particular recipe. You can also pass along uh, parameters that JSON API recognizes. Um, so you can include additional data, sort, things like that. And then uh, what that allows you is that, so inside of the provider, you can just use an HTML template. Um, might be a little hard to see, but just a template element. And inside of that, you can use any markup. So it could be custom elements, like we see here we have a card component. Um, but it also can be just any regular markup. So we have just some static markup there uh, for the template. And then also, as you'll see in here, you can also reference any of the data that comes back um, to that provider. So we can uh, reference the summary field to spit out the summary for the uh, recipe. And our, our headline right now is static, but we can use the double curly braces, kind of a twig friendly type thing, and reference the title field here. And now we see the actual title of the recipe. And a few other things that this can do, I'll actually remove this static markup for now, but um, so if it gets a single result back, it'll spit out the template. If we remove the ID here to get all recipes, if multiple results come back, it iterates over that template for every result. So you'll see here, here are all of our recipes. And then uh, because this template is an HTML template, we can do anything we can do with HTML, including uh, adding a style element here. Um, so we add a few lines of code to uh, style this as a grid using CSS grid. And then because this system recognizes those CSS custom properties, we can also set a few of those to uh, tweak the styles of the cards themselves. Um, so, uh, you know, that was a, a whole lot in, just in code to be able to get a set of data back um, just in markup here uh, to be able to display a grid of, of cards. So, you know, there's a lot of ways that a concept like this could be shared across components, um, but it, you know, seemed to be an interesting way to be able to use this, this technology to share uh, data from Drupal across a whole system of components. All right, so we're uh, just about wrapping up. I know that we, uh, we should have time for a few questions, but also I know that we're uh, keeping everybody away from the school cafeteria. <laughs> uh, but uh, so uh, given uh, these, this work, these experiments, kind of what's next for a project like this? Uh, speaking completely honestly, I think that at this point, uh, I need to revisit if a project like this in its current state really makes sense. Uh, we definitely have had uh, outside contributions, but maybe not enough to really sustain a library like this. And you know, I also have uh, limited time, so wondering from that perspective. Um, but also, you know, given some of the things that we learned here and some of the things that are going on in Drupal right now, I'm wondering if maybe the better focus are things uh, more broadly for Drupal that can make it easier to work with web components or you know, easier to work with these types of decoupled projects in general. So some of those things are, um, I've talked about this on and off before in, in various contexts, and you know, obviously worked on that library, Drupal State, but um, I've always had the dream of trying to get a variety of different people together to create like an actual official JavaScript client for Drupal. Um, and I think I, hopefully I'm going to finally make a uh, kind of last push to see if we can get some momentum around that. So if you want to learn more, uh, I'll, I'll be around and at the Contrib Day, so I'd love to talk more about that. Um, also in 10.1, that uh, experimental single directory components really does change the way that uh, you can build with components in Drupal. It you know, doesn't solve all of the problems, but certainly does solve some of them. And I think will make it easier to use web components in Drupal, which is awesome. And then just in general, anything that we can do to make Drupal more friendly for uh, web components, I believe would be a good thing in general. Which brings us to this last little bit um, related to that. 
uh, I think something that could be uh, you know, worked on with the community that I think would have a lot of value is trying to uh, solve issues with server-side rendering of web components in PHP. So I mentioned before that um, web components are JavaScript at the end of the day. So um, in the default use case, for it to be you know, fully interactive, JavaScript has to load on your page. Um, however, there have been some changes within the, uh, the actual APIs for web components and also supporting tools around it um, for a feature called declarative shadow DOM. All of these web components things have wild names, but um, that is uh, gaining uh, browser adoption. I think it's already supported in, in Chrome and Edge and I believe Safari recently um, and I think Firefox finally has official intent to support it. But uh, basically what uh, declarative shadow DOM uh, is, is it allows you to define a web component in static markup uh, that will render on the page even if JavaScript doesn't load. So as long as you have the server-side rendered markup for component, it will still render on the page. There are definitely certain things that you would only get like from a progressive enhancement standpoint if JavaScript does load, because those things are JavaScript. But you don't have the situation where, for example, if the uh, you know if JavaScript doesn't load or JavaScript breaks, the component just doesn't display, which is great. Um, and uh, that would be really great for Drupal because Drupal is a, you know a thing that server side renders. Um, and right now, there really isn't a great way to server-side render web components in Drupal. Um, a lot of the current solutions to take advantage of this declarative shadow DOM stuff is all written in Node. So I'm really not sure what the answer is there. But I do think if there was a way that Drupal could also have a similar solution where you can easily server-side render web components that work with or without JavaScript, it would be great for Drupal. It would allow us to take advantage of web components more broadly in Drupal. And it would also just be good for the PHP community in general. Uh, also do uh, want to take a second to thank uh, contributors to these, uh, these projects, uh, be it the menu web component as part of the decoupled menus initiative, uh, we had uh, somebody within the Summer of Code uh, last year contributing, uh, people who contributed generic Drupal web components, Drupal State, and if I missed you, I'm very, very sorry, and still appreciate your contributions. And uh, last what if question, what if the talk was over but you had questions? Uh, so yeah, do have some time for questions. Thanks everybody, I uh, hope this was interesting. Any questions? What sort of things do you want for lunch? <laughs> I have one question. So your definition of what component that you went over with like the custom tag, custom elements, that's different than single directory components, right? And the definition of what a component is. Yes. Okay. So yeah, the uh, the question was uh, your definition of a web component, that's different from single directory components. Uh, yes, so the way that I defined a web component uh, in the beginning was you know, browser APIs, that is the, uh, uh, a custom element, shadow DOM, and HTML templates. And then single directory components, um, what that is in Drupal is a new way that you can define a reusable component in Drupal. Basically, you know, it's called the single directory component, so it's a way that if you put markup, CSS, um, JavaScript in one directory, Drupal can recognize that and say, oh, this is a component. And then you can, with a twig function, render that throughout your templates. So those two things are not really directly related. However, uh, there are ways that I think single directory components does lend itself to that web component use case. Like, the absolute simplest part of it is, you know, to be able to have that custom element that you can use, you need to load a JavaScript file. And uh, 
developers who are not you know, as familiar with Drupal, like they would have to create a library, they don't know what that is, et cetera, et cetera. Single directory components, as I understand it, allow you to just put a JavaScript file in a directory next to a template and it works. Um, so that streamlines the whole deal with web components. If somebody knows how to write a web component, they can do it in a JavaScript file, uh, drop it in this directory, and then they can just use their custom element that they just created with whatever name they want, uh, which rules, in my opinion. Uh, any other questions? All right. Thanks, everybody, and I'll be around if you want to talk more. <laughs>